This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. All right, welcome back into Mizzou. That's who. Super excited to be joined by Coach David Nutt with us. Coach, how you doing? How's the summer been going since we've uh, last talked to Mizzou Hoops? Good, good. It's been good, and thank you, and, and glad to be with you. Glad to have you here, too, as well. But uh, very excited. Lots of buzz around this Mizzou program uh, heading into this year. Um, you know, Gabe, why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, the Mizzou Hoops coming into this season and kind of uh, the hype that's surrounded it? Well, First of all, um, we lost uh, uh, a couple unbelievable players last year. Several, several good players last year. Uh, obviously, Kobe, Kobe Bryant going in. Kobe, Kobe Brown going in the first round. Demoy Hodge now with the Lakers. Those guys were so good for us. Trey Goldston, uh, Ben Sternberg. Uh, those guys were were so good for us. And and it's a uh, um, it, it's been different for us. We we've had. I, I think seven brand new players, and so we're excited about those guys. We we feel like that we filled filled a few of the voids, uh, but it remains to be seen. But uh, it's been a kind of work in pro uh, progress. But we we've had a, a really good summer and a good preseason, and so we're gearing up and we're ready for our first game uh, starting here pretty soon. I think November third. Uh, but again, the schedule is uh, it's certainly going to be very challenging for us, but I think in the long run it's going to help us become a better team in the SEC and postseason play. So with all that being said, we're, we're excited about uh, the, the potential of this basketball team and looking forward to it. Coach, you, you mentioned the seven new players, and I guess last year technically you had 15 new players because they were all kind of new to you guys in, in year one. But, I mean, that, that just seems to be now kind of what college basketball is, is that – is that the way going forward? Like you kind of have to get used to, you're not starting completely over every year, but you're coming a lot closer than maybe you did at some of your previous stops. Well, that, that is a great observation. You're, you're exactly right. It, the times have changed so much. Um, the day where that you could count on a young person becoming a freshman, sophomore, junior, and Hey, three to four years from now, he'd be really, really good. I, I don't know that you can uh, actually count on that anymore because of the portal uh, the, because of the one-time transfer rule, uh, all of those things play a big role. We're, we're just thankful we got a guy like Dennis Gates that that has it all figured out because it seems like he does. Last year, just like you mentioned, he single-handedly put together about 13, 14 players to go along with the three players that we had returning. And he did that primarily on his own uh, before anybody was hired. I think he Coach Ryan Sharball was the first one that he hired, and, and he was the one that was with him almost every day during that time. But to have the foresight and have the, uh, uh, the talents to be able to get these kind of players that we did last year uh, to help us have an incredible year, 25 wins, uh, says a lot about him as a recruiter and a person and a, and a guy that, that collects relationships. But – and now to turn around and do that again, obviously he had a little bit of help this year um, with Coach Charlton Young with him, Coach Kyle Smith-Peters, uh, Matt Clyde, and myself to able to help him with a little, you know, a, a little recruiting to to fill a roster. And uh, we, we think we've done that. And and, and we think that, um, that we may uh, certainly be as good, if not better, uh, than we were last year, not to step out on a limb uh, and say that, but, but – I, I do feel like that that we have a chance to be good again. Hi, Coach. It was so nice to meet you this weekend. Uh, yes, the parade. Yeah, it was, good to see you. It, it was so random just like running into uh, you and uh, <laughs> CY and all of them. So, yeah, great seeing you again. Um, I'm sure we're going to talk about some of the, the um, 2024 recruits here in a little bit, so I won't get into that. But um, in the offseason this year, uh, it seems like every – I don't know, a couple of days we were, you know, we were picking up a new transfer, which was so cool to see. Um, speaking of like all of those new transfers, what do you see out of them? Like our strengths, weaknesses, backcourt, frontcourt. I, I think we have a really, really, really strong backcourt, like looking at it. I don't know as much about the front court. Yeah. I, I, I see the strengths in the back court, but what can you tell us about those transfers? Well, you 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 know your basketball and, and you you you've touched on it, but but I, I really feel like that we filled the, the very first thing that let me let me take you inside a meeting for a second. 
if if we're sitting in a meeting with Dennis Gates and you guys are all of our recruiters, the first thing he's going to say, or two, uh, we're going we're going to find two things. Number one, we're going to find an incredible person. The character is number one. Number two, he better be able to shoot the ball. And I think that is the thing that we went after um, in the portal and in on the transfer um, uh, level is to make sure these guys that can play, not only that can play, but at a high level and can really, really shoot the basketball. But then you add uh, three outstanding freshmen with these guys. If you look at Trent Pierce from Tulsa, Oklahoma, you look at Anthony Robinson from Tallahassee, and then you look at Jordan Butler, that's seven foot tall from South Carolina. I mean, those are three dynamite freshmen. Um, and so those guys look for them to have impacts, even as freshmen. Um, so if you add the freshmen to the, the transfer portal and the guys that we've been able to get, the thing with the transfer portal that makes it different in a lot of ways is that they've, they've almost been, they've proven, they, 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 have, they have stats already. They might have played in the Big Ten like Tamar Bates. They might have played in a different conference, uh, whether it be Connor Vanover or whether it be Tamar Bates or John Tanjay. Uh, some of those, like Kurt Lewis, uh, obviously is it from a junior college, the National Player of the Year uh, that won a national championship on the ju junior college level. These guys bring us a lot of not only experience, but they bring us some age. And there's something about that that when you have an older player, you seem to be a little bit better when you have that older player. It's like us playing, and if we play in a game three on three, four on four, hey, nine times out of ten, we're going to beat that junior high kid. We're going to beat that kid that's 15 years old versus us that are 19 or 20. We're just going to be better than they are. We're a little bit bigger and stronger and more wise. And so that's kind of the, the recruiting uh, philosophy that Dennis Gates has is that we want to stay older. We want that experience. Um, now, are, are we big believers in the NIL and the transfer portal? I don't, I don't know. You know, we can debate that all we want. I try not to be a dinosaur. But the bottom line is it's the way of the world. And so you better get with it. You better get in it. You better get in the game. If it's the, if it's the NIL, you better get in the game because I promise you Kansas is doing it. I promise you Alabama's doing it. So we got to make sure that we're in the game and we're right in the middle of it. And I would say that we've done fairly well this year. We're, our recruiting is, is, uh, has gone very, very well this year. And obviously when you have a guy like Dennis Gates and you can take him into a living room with his mom and dad, hey, the moms tell me nine out of ten times, hey, Coach Nut, I want my son playing for Dennis Gates. You know why? And I said, why? Because of his demeanor on the sideline. I'm telling you, it stands out. If I've heard it once, I've heard it a million times from moms all across the country. I want my son playing for him. And that's what you have when you take a guy into uh, one of our recruits' homes like Dennis Gates, it's over. When we walk out of there, I promise you that mom and dad is are they're shaking their heads. And I tell him all the time, I try to give him high five every time we get back on on the play. And I say, Coach, that's that's one of your best jobs. And he says, you say that every time. I said, well, I mean it. <laughs> oh, it's good to hear that. And, and we've seen him. We've seen, uh, obviously, things going around about how good of a, a recruiter Dennis Gates is. But I kind of want to talk about filling that void of Kobe Brown this year, uh, right? Because I know that one person can't step up and kind of make Kobe Brown uh, fill that role of Kobe Brown. Kind of how do you guys uh, replace a guy like that? It's a loaded question. I know it is, Coach. But how do you try to replace a guy like that in his productivity? Well, you're talking about Kobe Brown, right? Yes, sir. Um, he he is an amazing, amazing young man, and we're we're so proud of him winning the first round of the NBA draft. You know how big that is. I mean, that's huge because I'm going to tell you when we when we showed up on campus, all of our NBA guys and all of our relationships and connections, they never said a word about Kobe Brown. They said, ah, you know, no, nah, I don't think he's going to do it. You know, he's a good player, maybe overseas or something. But that goes back to Dennis Gates again. That goes back to the player development that we've done every day with him. And, and the biggest thing, somebody, they ask me all the time, well, what's the difference? You know, I mean, surely uh, player development is working on your ball handling, your shooting. And I said, well, let me, let me back up. 
All of that may be the same, but there's one difference. When Dennis Gates convinces you that you're really, really good, that's the difference. It's a mindset. And when he has him in his office, he tells him, hey, you don't realize just how good you're going to be. And every day, he might miss that one or two or three shots. You know what he tells him? Hey, Kobe, you're going to hit that next one. Shoot that next one now. We got rebounders. Don't worry about that. And so that's the confidence. And when, when, when Dennis Gates gave him that confidence, he went to another level. And when he went to the next level, guess what? He goes in the first round. Yeah. And who in the world? And so that's coaching. Yes, we can say player development. Yeah, we can put him through all kind of drills, make him shoot a thousand shots a day. But it goes back to that secret. Dennis Gates told him that he's going to be really, really good. It's like my daughter growing up, my daughter, Lexus. I told her every day when she was little, you're the most beautiful girl in the world. And hey, you know what? She just kind of felt it. I mean, she kind of knew it at a fault sometimes. <laughs> Sorry well, about that. I didn't mean to get away from that. No, no, no. no. I, I want to say, first of all, that the smartest thing that's ever been said on this podcast is that we're trying to be older because it has more wisdom. So I want you two young people on this podcast. <laughs> I, I, uh, I'll take um, that. But, uh, it, Coach, it, obviously, it's, it's obvious why you followed Dennis here and hearing you talk about him. But I wonder if you could just kind of give the fans an idea who, you know, you were, you knew basketball in this area. You've been in this area. But, Tell us about your relationship with Dennis, how that started, how you guys kind of came together. Because um, I know as many people as are in college basketball, it's it's a really small world sometimes the way people end up together. Yeah, it certainly is. And let, let me share with you um, just how we got started. Um, I, I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas in a wonderful home. Mom and dad, a Christian home. Three brothers all in coaching. Houston was the football coach at Arkansas and Ole Miss. My brother Danny was his assistant all those years. Um, my youngest brother Dennis is now the head coach at Wachita Baptist, a Division II school in Arkadelphia, Arkansas. He played six years in the NBA. We're all mad at him because we were better than he was, and he got to play in the NBA. <laughs> but I went to – we all went to Little Rock Central High School, and then we went to Oklahoma State University. And when I played in Oklahoma State, and I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but we were in the Big Eight. And I hated coming to Columbia. I hated it, you know, Glenn, because the Antlers, they wore me out. They wore my last name out. Now, my real name is David. My birth name is David. But everybody calls me Dickie. And, uh, but they, they would wear me out when I came to Columbia. I'm telling you, I cried all the way home every time. I hated coming to Columbia. I tried to pull like, like I had a hurt leg or something and try to miss that trip, but Anyway, long story short, I became grad assistant at Oklahoma State University for my coach, uh, the late Paul Hanson. And after one year, he retired, and they hired a hot jock coach from Kentucky. And they brought him in, and he went right down the aisle, right down the hallway the first day, and he said, you're out, you're out, you're out. And he pointed at me and said, I'm out. So I was packing my boxes, and I was walking out one afternoon, and he said, and that hot jock coach said, hey, come here. What's your name? I said, Dickie Nutt. He said, that's not your name. I said, well, it's David. But everybody calls me Dickie. And he said, you want to work for me? And I said, I sure do. And he and that was Leonard Hamilton, who's now the head coach at Florida State. Yeah. So he hired me, Bill Self, and Tim Carter. We were all together for three years. And then he got a job offer to go to University of Miami. And I said, man, I'm, I'm going to South Beach. So he comes <laughs> in. He said, no, you're going to Arkansas State. I said, you got to be kidding. Are you serious, coach? And to Coach Hamilton is kind of the godfather. We do what he tells us to do. So I went to Jonesboro, Arkansas, and I became head coach. I was a head coach there for 13 years. And then I went over to southeast Missouri right down the road at Cape Girardeau. And I really enjoyed my, my six years there. Now, unfortunately, we had four athletic directors in six years, because you can imagine what that's about. Anyway, in 2016, I think it was, I was fired. And the very next day, I got a call from Leonard Hamilton and said, Coach Nutt, what are you going to do? And I said, well, Seymour has to pay me for a couple of years. Maybe I'll just play golf. And he said, no, you're going to come come work for me. And I said, really? So I, sh I, I should have just written Southeast Missouri, a thank you note. So I go to Florida State. 
and he puts me in a in an office right across from a 39 year old young guy by the name of Dennis Gates. And I watched him every day. I watched him put a practice schedule together. I watched his relationship with the players. I watched him do a scouting report. I, I saw all of that. See why Coach Charlton Young down the hallway and then Coach Hamilton in his head coaching office. And we had three of the most amazing years. And then one afternoon, Dennis Gates comes in and knocks on my door and says, Coach Nutt, I've never been a head coach. And I've got a job offer to go to Cleveland State University to be the head coach, and I'm going, and I need you to come with me. I said, wait a minute, Coach. We live in Florida. Why would we want to do that? And uh, But he made it where I couldn't say no, and I went with him. And I watched him become one of the hottest coaches in America, back-to-back coach of the year. He should have got coach of the year the third year. That was his best job. I saw him win conference championships. I saw him get to the NCAA tournament somewhere they hadn't been in 20-something years at Cleveland State. Now, all of a sudden, he's the hottest coaches in America. He's the hottest coach in America. He could go anywhere he wanted to. LSU, Georgia, South Carolina, Missouri, they were all open. And he chose Missouri. And now, all of a sudden, I've got my breath held because I wanted to make sure he took me with him. <laughs> and thank goodness he did. And so that's our relationship. That's kind of how we got started. And I've been so just tickled to death that that I'm here with him and, and able to assist him every day. And, and uh, but, but I can assure you, he doesn't need my assistance. He, he he's, he's well on his way. But I'm glad to be here. And that's kind of our relationship, how we have got started. And I uh, hope that answers that. Well, obviously, you're from like a prestigious coaching family. I'm from a coaching family, not that prestigious, but <laughs> I understand what it's like to be in a coaching family. Was there ever a part of you that was like, you know what? I don't think I want to go in the coaching. I don't think <laughs> it's for me. I think I might, you know, go be a teacher or I might be a doctor. Were you like, it was always in the cards for you? You know, it's funny you say that. I, I appreciate you bringing that up because I was born. Like I said, not to be redundant, but I was born in a wonderful family. But I got to tell you a short story about my dad. And obviously, he passed away several years ago. But my dad grew up in a place called Fordyce, Arkansas, way down south Arkansas, famous town. Paul Bear Bryant, Barry Switzer, Larry Lacewell, they were all from Fordyce, Arkansas. Well, my dad was born in a family of nine. He had a mom, dad, six brothers and sisters, all entirely deaf. Except him. Yeah, think about it. His mom, his dad, his brothers, sisters, all deaf. Except him. And he grew up in this deaf family. Now, can you imagine the fun that was poked at that family? Not to mention, last name Nut. Well, he grew up and became the number one player in the state of Arkansas and signed with the number one team in America that year, the University of Kentucky. Played for Adolf Rupp for two years and they got put on probation said he had nothing to do with it transferred and went to Oklahoma State and played for Henry Iba two of the greatest coaches of all time and his roommate was Eddie Sutton and so back then the NBA was no big deal all he really wanted to do was get married he married my mother that he met in school and go back to Little Rock where they had offered him a job at the death school because he could sign and he had four boys Houston David, Danny, and Dennis. And we were all signing before we were talking. And today we're all certified deaf interpreters. We always knew this was going to be a great second language. Until about 20-something years ago, I was named head coach at Arkansas State. In the first game, I looked up about 12 rows. 12 rows, and my dad's up there saying, how come number 25 is not in the game? I go, hey, oh, man, hey, oh, man, you got to go get a Coke. But... We have been very blessed to be in that family. I have two two boys. I mentioned my daughter, Alexis, and I have two boys in coaching, and I have tried to convince them, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Um, but uh, in our family, my immediate family, my two brothers, Houston and Danny, are in football, and Dennis and I in basketball, and we argue all the time that the football is the easiest sports. Hey, you win five or six games, you go to a bowl game. Yeah. <laughs> are you serious? Hey, we're 500. We get fired. I promise you that. But uh, anyway, that's kind of the story uh, of our family. 
with coach. That's, that's awesome. Um, love to hear that great story. Um, before we let you go, I, I want to ask just a, just a question about the non-conference schedules. So this is coming up. Uh, you guys have a little bit different of approach this year with the non-conference schedule than maybe last year. So what, what are your thoughts on the slate, the upcoming slate here for you guys? Our schedule? Yes. <laughs> it's brutal. Brutal. I, <laughs> I, I grab my forehead every day when I'm looking at Coach Gates and, and Coach Gates is, hey, we're going to be good. We're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. Let, let me tell you, I think that, that it is absolutely going to be one of the most challenging schedules that the University of Missouri basketball has had in a long time. Mm. And I say that with all sincerity. I say that with all respect. You look at Kansas, Illinois, Seton Hall, Minnesota, Memphis. You can go right down the line. Uh, last year, everybody complained because we were, what, 10-0? and 0? Um, You know, and they say, oh, the schedule is too soft. You know, <laughs> well, at, at the coach, um, you want your young people to experience success. Winning breeds winning. Yeah. Um, and so – with that being said, but I will say this. I think that this team is up for the challenge. I think we're, we're ready. And I say, I say this because the majority of our games are at home in non-conference schedule. Obviously, we're power five. It should be that way. But our home crowd and our home fans are phenomenal. I mean, if you look around the country, I don't know if you – there's many that hold 16,000. With our student section the way they are, that get there an hour and a half before tip-off, and I'm telling you, it is a happening in that facility. And that's what I love about that. And, I, and I'll share this with you with the scheduling. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why Dennis Gates chose University of Missouri. A lot of reasons. Could be SEC, never been to the Final Four, couldn't win a national title here, or support our facilities. But one of the biggest reasons he came here was because of Desiree Reed Francois, her leadership. And she recruited him better than anybody that, that I've ever seen. Mm. And not only that, you know, he tells me that all the time as, as kind of maybe the old man on staff. Sometimes he may talk to me a little bit different behind closed doors in terms of just why and maybe just give me his personal thoughts on things. And it always goes back to her. Desiree, she, has, she just gets it. She just gets it. Let me give you an example. You know, last year we won 25 games. We finished fourth in the league, about seven or eight places better than they predicted. Um, Coach Coach Gates, we, what did we do? Go to the final 32 in the in the NCAA conference. Any athletic director in America had every right to say, "Hey, hey, hey! Great job, Coach! Great job! We're going to give you a little bit of a raise. We're going to extend your contract. We're going to give you give your assistants maybe a little raise. You know, whatever. You need to do it again." But what does she do? She does that, but she said, uh, it's not good enough. Here's what we need. Our scoreboard's not good enough. We need a new one. That sound system's not right. We need a new one. Hey, th that seating's not good enough. We need to change out those seatings. Now, that's leadership. That's leadership because she could have very well said, hey, great job, guys. Let's do it again. But what does she do? She ups the ante and says, no, we we've got to keep up with you. And so that's the kind of leadership you're dealing with. And that's why if you look out there on the football field, you see what Drake and those guys are doing. And my hat's off to them. What? A, and he, he was at practice today watching us and saying hi to Coach Gates. But that's the teamwork that you have on this campus. And it all starts with leadership. It goes back to her. And and we're, we're proud of that. And we just want to make her uh, happy and, and, and please her every day. And I think that's, um, I, I think when our fans walk into to our arena this year, they're going to be blown away. They're going to say, wow, because it's breathtaking. The new seats, uh, the new scoreboard. I mean, you're talking, you know, there's not any. You know, the NBA is the elite of all the facilities. They have the best of the best. I, I promise you, we're just right there. And so with all that being said, I'm hopeful that will become the sixth man for our basketball team and that we can really get good in that non-conference schedule because – the bottom line is the SEC is going to be the most important run for us. They're all going to be good. There's not going to be any – you can't look at that schedule anymore and say, oh, we're going to win two games on this one. You look at Chris Beard that's moved into to Ole Miss and, and some of those guys, hey, it's, it's a brand-new game now. And so we better lace them up and be ready to go. And I think we will. And you couldn't, you couldn't ask for a better leader than Dennis Gates. 
Maggie, go ahead, because I want to go last so I can end with Coach Nutt and make him tell a non-basketball story that's <laughs> going to leave everybody all happy. But I, I can tell you one before I leave. I, yeah, do you have a couple of minutes? Yeah, okay. I, I've got I've got one in mind, but okay. I'm, well, here here one, and then I'm going to make you tell everybody the story you, you told know, me on the golf course. I'm I'm not well. Yeah, that's another story. But hey, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I will tell you what, when I signed with Oklahoma State University, they took me to school. And I showed up on August 14th. I won't tell you the year. My coaches were there to greet me at Iowa Hall. I had my suitcases. They said, Coach, we're going to get on this elevator. We're going to go to the fourth floor. <laughs> so we go to the fourth floor. We go down to room 202. And I knocked on, and we knocked on the door. And a track guy comes to my door. His name was Robin Klein. And he said, Dickie, this is your roommate, Robin Klein. I shook his hand. Hey, nice to meet you. Where are you from? So forth. And I walked down the hall with my coaches. I said, Coach, can I not have a basketball roommate? And they said, hey, son, you're lucky to be here. So I said, okay, no problem, no problem. So every day I'd go to practice. I'd come back to the dorm. I'd go down to eat. I'd come up to my room. And my roommate has got the next door guy roommate, another track guy. They're in there on my bed playing their country music. Now, me being from Little Rock, I didn't do country music. I do today. But I didn't do country. I said, no, no, out of here. And well, you know who I ran out every day? Garth Brooks. Yeah, he's in there. Blame it all on my I go, oh, God. Ow, ow, ow. Every day. Now, we're best friends to this day. Now, that's how I'm not very smart. And it gets worse. He hires my friend, my, my roommate, Robin. He hires him to drive his buses. Still driving them today for a million dollars a year. And I'm down here blocking out, rebounding. It's messed up. But that uh, that's my story, and, and uh, I know a lot of people have heard it, I guess, but he, one of the nicest guys you'll ever, ever meet. So it all, I tell these young guys all the time, always take care of the relationships you're around. You never know. You mm. never know when and where they go. And so uh, so anyway, you may be referring to that one. I don't know. It, it, it's my favorite story. Absolutely. <laughs> Maggie, go ahead and finish it up. I paid good money to see Garth Brooks a couple of years ago when he came when he did his last that, tour in St. Louis. So. The the best of the best. I when I went to to the Wynn Hotel one day to watch him open up about I don't know about eight years ago. If we still talk about that story, he's uh he's an amazing guy. He says, "Coach, you ran me out every night." I said, "Yeah, I thought you were pitiful." Ah. <laughs> Well, he's, he's the best in the world, man. The best, the best in that business, that's for sure. Well, I have a non. My last question is a non-basketball question. I asked it to Kobe last year when we had him on the podcast. I feel like yeah. I have to ask you. It's just like a the local Columbia question. Um, what is your favorite Columbia restaurant? Where's your place you like to go if you're picking a, where you like to eat in Columbia? What's your <laughs> go-to? What's your go-to spot? Well, the go-to spot for me has to be Murray's. You know, I, I, I love Murray's because the, the food is phenomenal. Mark is just such a, uh, uh, a, a great friend. Um, I think that's a, a phenomenal place to go and, and hang out with, with a lot of our friends and fans. And, uh, you know, Flat, Flat Branch is another one that we go to often. But, but uh, it's hard to beat Murray's and, and Mark and what he does over there. Good spot. It's good. Gabe, did you do you want to do you want to wrap? No, up? no. I I just wanted to hear the Garth Brooks story. <laughs> okay. you know, I, mean, I I didn't know if you were looking for another story. No, or what? And I will finish it up by saying that Coach Nutt. I had a chance to to just be in a group that played golf with him last summer, and he told that story. And do not look, Coach. If you ever walk away and just decide to play golf, nobody should like don't <laughs> let Coach Nutt hustle you on the golf course because you are oh. way poorer than when you walked in. Well, I want it clear. We didn't gamble at all, but like he would have taken a lot of money from it. Well, you know what? I, we fell in love with that game uh, several years ago, and sometimes uh, they tell me, hey, you're spending way too much time on a golf course. Now, there was a time in my career that that would bother me, but trust me, it does not bother me nowadays. But uh, <laughs> no, I love to play, and I'm out here at Old Hawthorne a lot and play in Country Club in Missouri and, and play a little bit. But as a coach, you don't get to play a whole lot, but when you do, you're always you're playing with 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 people that you love to meet and and you wind up being best friends um and that's what makes it so cool to be here in Columbia Missouri you know we 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 check out a lot of NBA games and and practices and for 
for for for development. And it always goes back to the same thing. It's you're in unbelievable traffic. Uh, you're in a taxi cab going here to there and here to there. And Coach Gates and I both look at each other and go, we can't wait to get back to Columbia, Missouri. You know, and that's uh, – it, it's been fun, been good, and I appreciate your kind words on that. But uh, we, we look forward to uh, another good year. Yep. Well, Coach, we're very uh, happy that you joined us. Very, uh, very great uh, episode with you, Yvonne. Loved, well, uh, loved, loved every minute. Well, thank you for having me. Yes, sir. Right. To, uh, All right. Two two weeks. Uh, you guys, uh, you you ready? I guess. Yeah. No well, take on. take your time. Take your time. We <laughs> we we got to get a lot of stuff in. But no, we're doing good. Our guys are doing good. I think they're looking forward to playing somebody different. We we've been at it since probably June. Uh, you know, with the trip to Jamaica was good for us. Yeah. Uh, we were able to get a scrimmage in, and now uh, another scrimmage coming up, and and uh, so we look forward to playing somebody else and. Hey, I think it's November 3rd, UAPB, Pine Bluff comes in, and we got Memphis coming in. So, hey, we got to get ready. Our fans got to be here ready to roll. There it is. You heard the man. All right, that's going to do it uh, for today's episode. Thank you. Appreciate you coaching up for uh, spending some time with us today. Absolutely. Good to see all of you.